So today we have the author of an article that Johnny and I really enjoyed from the Huffington Post. And we're going to talk about the concept of self-esteem and how artificially inflating self-esteem is actually detrimental, which is counterintuitive to a lot of us when we're talking about negative thought processes and how to overcome some of our negative beliefs in ourselves. And we're so excited to have Dr. Stephen Hayes with us today, author of Is Self-Compassion More Important Than Self-Esteem? And in the prep for the show, Johnny and I were laughing because we really grew up in the age of the self-esteem boom, where in schools we were taught even going to pep rallies, yeah. as, John, as Johnny was saying, about self-esteem and trying to inflate everyone's self-esteem to get high performance out of children and ultimately later in life. And what's so interesting about it is science is showing we may have been wrong in that movement. And the research that we're gonna dig into today is a fascinating look at self-compassion is something that maybe a lot of our listeners may not have even heard of or thought about is actually the key to success. Now, Dr. Stephen Hay is with us, professor at the University of Nevada. He's one of the most distinguished and impactful psychologists of all time. He's written over 40 books and published nearly 600 scientific articles. He's one of the founding fathers of acceptance and commitment therapy and a huge part of our training programs here at The Art of Charm. And Johnny and I have been giddy to have this interview because... Well, I just wanted to say that in doing this podcast and doing the work that we do, there are opportunities when we get to meet somebody that we look up to so much. And, and for us to do this and to have Stephen Hayes here today is, is, is an honor and a thrill. And it is one of the most effective therapy forms out there when it comes to dealing with social anxiety. And we've been trying to incorporate as much of it as possible in our programs for those students of ours who do suffer from social anxiety. And obviously we all have those negative voices in our heads. We're gonna talk about the bully in upstairs and also how we can start the practice of self-compassion. But first things first, it's great to have you with us here. In the article, you write about self-esteem, a term that gets thrown around a lot these days, and everyone seems to be fascinated with gaining more self-esteem, especially in the self-development field. However, science is starting to look at it in a little more critical way, and I think some of our listeners may not even be up to speed on the science behind it. But before we get to what the problem is, could you explain to our listeners what self-esteem is? Well, the way it's usually thought about is just those positive judgments that you make of yourself and holding yourself in high self-regard. And we know that people who are successful in life and are moving ahead very often have more positive opinions about themselves and their role in, in life, their relationships, how they're doing at work and so forth. And the psychologist grabbed on that and said, okay, that's why they're successful. Let's just see if we can drive that thing up, and then people will do a lot better. It turns out that's not true, but it wasn't deliberately wrong. It just turned out to be catastrophically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, they were coming from the right place, and obviously yeah. looking broadly at success, you would think that if you hold yourself in high regard, you're gonna be able to accomplish great feats. Yeah, it would look like that. The problem is you can get that in artificial ways. But you know, every parent, every teacher, everybody looking at a young person, when they see the voice within begin to come in and wag a finger and criticize, and you're looking from the outside and say, no, no, you're, you're kind, you're, you're able. You're, and the idea is, well, let's fix that. Let's get the right voice within. Uh, the problem with that is it uh, leads to what we see just even cartoons. Very young kids understand this, that the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other, you know, goofy with horns and goofy with a halo. You know, what you're feeding is this kind of idea that you'll be a powerful, whole, effective person when you have that clear, positive vision of yourself that never wavers. That's a fantasy. That doesn't exist in anybody. If you know anybody well from the inside, and you know yourself pretty well from the inside, you know that's not true. And the only way to get that even close to true is unhealthy. But from the outside, man, look at that person. They're so confident. They never show anything like what I'm feeling. And you feel alone in that. Right. And you, you go for what you think would get you that. 
turns out it's not what's going to get you that. And of course, you can put even more pressure on and judgment on yourself when you're like, well, wait a second, I can't seem to quiet this negative voice. I can't seem to get this side to go away. I can't turn up the volume on the positive voice. What's wrong with me? Exactly. And the, the thing that draws you into that is the immediate effect. Like, let's say you're really into a spin where the voice within is getting pretty crit- critical, etc. And you bring that kind of self-esteem training that you've got to it. You're going to get a little pop there. You're going to feel a little better about yourself for a little while. And everything we know about how human life works and life on the planet works is smaller sooner is more important than larger later. And you get pulled into this like narrowing fish trap of, oh, I'm, I'm doing better. No, I'm not doing better. And then you almost, I'll do it again, I'll do it again, I'll do it again. You're almost shouting at yourself to try to produce the consistent positive self-evaluation that will wipe out and eliminate a race and push away all of these other negative thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations that any human life is going to collect. So as that amplifies, you're getting drawn in just like you would with an addiction or any other kind of unhealthy habit. The long-term outcomes are poor, but the short-term outcomes seems like it kind of works. When you, you know, deflect your attention, you try to reassure yourself, you get your friends to actually tell you nice things to yourself, you set it up. So how am I doing? You, know, you, you deliberately kind of manipulate your environment to get these positive voices. Meanwhile, uh, your capacity to really be a whole person and to focus on something you deeply care about, which very often be the exact places where things are hard, precisely right. because you care so much about that, probably means that's a place where you can be hurt, uh, gets foreshortened and you start taking the cheap thrills of uh, positive self-statements and the emptiness that that produces long term. Yeah, we can create unhealthy habits to distract ourselves from the negative voice, to avoid it at all costs, not set ourselves up to fail, to live completely in this little bubble of positivity. But that doesn't lead to long-term success. Well, you can see why in a sense. If a negative voice that you notice, if you had to reassure yourself that's really positive and push yourself, you'd probably notice something negative, otherwise you wouldn't do that in the first place, Mm -hmm. right? So, but if the deep message is that negative voice might be true, that might be real. I've got to get rid of that. Well, what are you saying? You're saying it's really important. It's really big. It deserves a lot of attention. That's the exact opposite of what you'd want to do. And so you're drawn into this thing by the, the process can't possibly give you the outcome. Because what, it's, what you're buying into is that those negative thoughts themselves are true or they're bad or they have to be eliminated or erased. No, they're not. They're just the voice. You'll catch yourself, for example, saying things to yourself that if you slow it down, you wait a minute, that's like what my mother said. Well, do you think? <laughs> you got planet <laughs> of course somewhere. It's, yeah, you learned it somewhere. Or if not, your sibling, your friend, the you know, girlfriend had dumped you, you know, whatever, echoing for the rest of your life, you're ever gonna not remember your own memories? How are you gonna do that? As this joke goes, sort of a frontal lobotomy or a bottle in front of me, there's no way to do that. And so you're taking it more seriously, you're you're building it up, and you're sort of buying into the truth of it. That if you have a negative thought, it means there's something wrong with you. And therefore, you have to replace it with a positive thought. That's kind of a negative thing to do. It looks positive, it looks sweet smelling, but it's based on something that buys into the negativity. And I'm, w- I'm with people that self esteem, neg- negative self-concepts do need work, but you don't do the work by first buying into them and then trying to color, you know, kind of erase them. There's, there's a very good alternative that we know about and is far more powerful in delivering what you really wanted anyway. And well, I think for a lot of us, that can become like whack-a-mole, right? Yeah. It becomes all-consuming. Now we're constantly fighting every negative thought anytime it pops up, and it can so quickly distract us. When a lot of what we're going to dig into in a little bit here about self-compassion is let it run its course, just move on. The more we hold on to it, the more damage we do in the first place. Yeah, if you, if you find a place in which you can take it a little less seriously, get a little space, a little distance, not to eliminate, not to erase, but just get perspective. I mean, if you stood right in front of a painting, put your 
nose on it. You wouldn't be able to see anything. And sometimes when we disappear into our negative thoughts, it's like that. They keep us from seeing what's possible. People to love, things to create, people to help, shows to put on, podcasts to organize, whatever's <coughs> there, you know, what's there for your uh, life. So there is a need to do something with the negativity. The problem is that the short-term pop of pushing yourself towards this artificial list of the positive statements, self-esteem of that sort, um, actually creates a self-amplifying loop. And we've seen that in the, you mentioned the, the uh, rallies at your school, the self-esteem rallies. And Ab sort of. Absolutely, and I, what I wanted to, to talk, uh, to bring that up, we were all laughing earlier and AJ mentioned it in, to, in the introduction. And what it was, was I remember going to these things and it's like, they, they seem to be every couple months. And, and I remember asking, what, what, is, what is this about? Why are we doing this? And I remember hearing it's a self-esteem pep rally. Now, as a, a young adult, you're 13, 14 years old, Sure, some children are growing up in an environment that is unhealthy, toxic, they have a, they're, they're being abused, and they're having a lot of issues. But for where I grew up, uh, it, was, it was a middle class a, a neighborhood and middle class school, and for, for the most part, everyone had a, um, a two-parent home, and, and I remember thinking going into those things, well, I don't need this, I feel great. And I think for all the other children who had a normal upbringing, I put that in air quotes as hmm. for that time, um, they, they were in the same position. So, so it's like, well, this is useless. Who needs it? So then we have to understand, we have to start looking at, well, who needs this pep rally? So now there's, we now find out there's a, there are some kids who do need this pep rally. So now all of a sudden, they're, they become targets of why we have to go do this thing so not only are we we're now learning that these thoughts are bad we're we're and now we're on our so we're setting ourselves up for failure and and a very hard time growing properly and now we're singling out kids who this pep rally is for and all of a sudden they become a target did that actually happen did you see that in, in your school oh absolutely and that's pretty creepy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a sad outcome of this. Yes. And, and obviously, you know, when we think about low self-esteem, it does have some negative impacts on yeah. your mental health and well-being. So they were coming at it from a place of, hey, if you have low self-esteem, we see a lot of impact on your mental health and poor outcomes in children. So let's try to amplify it. But I think what's really interesting and, and I may be wrong on the, the concept of imposter syndrome, but it feels like, you know, now that we've all gone through high school and we've graduated from college, some of this artificial enhancement of self-esteem is coming home to roost. And now people are mm -hmm. like, I feel like a complete imposter yeah. when their self-esteem runs out and all of a sudden they're getting results beyond what this artificial self-esteem allowed them to feel comfortable with and it all comes crashing down. I'm not worthy, I don't belong here, people are gonna find out that I'm fraud. a fraud, people are gonna find out that this negative voice is the truth, and those thoughts are really impactful on young adults and into your adulthood. There's actually uh, controlled studies on this. If you teach people to think sort of positive self-statements, it has that short-term pop. Uh, the problem is, as soon as you need them, as soon as something happens in your life where you actually need them, they actually have a negative effect, and it's exactly what you talked about. You, you, you apply it, it's inert, it's not moving anything. Next thing you know, you got a whole number of wave of brand new self-criticism. How come you can't do it? Other people can do it, you were told you can do it, you even saw the pep rally. You know, <laughs> and, and, and while it wasn't needed, it kind of actually sort of worked. It didn't really do what you hoped, because it really didn't produce a kind of wholeness or self-confidence it didn't really enhance your ability to be yourself with yourself as a whole human being. But it kind of seemed okay. When you really need it, it no longer even seems okay. People 
go head towards anxiety, depression, etc. inside the very attempt to try to talk themselves into feeling good about themselves. So that's almost cruel. I mean, you're going to give people tools that work as long as you don't need them. I mean, what kind of a tool is that? How about if we do something that will be there when you need it? And you, there are times you're going to face things. You're going to face betrayal. You're going to see death. You're going to have failures. You know, people will not always be your friend, etc. And you better have the tools to step into pain, including this pain that's self-imposed by self-criticism, and do something healthy with it that will orient you towards the kind of life that you want to live. And it's, it's like this artificial insurance, right? You think that if I just think positive and I keep these positive thoughts, it's going to be there when I need it and it's going to work. And it actually is more impactful the opposite direction. And we were laughing about this earlier. Think about this artificial enhancement of self-esteem and its impact on narcissism and yeah. entitlement and feeling that because I have high self-esteem, the world owes me everything. Well, that's almost the creepier outcome. I mean, you feel badly for people who, when they really need it, it abandons them. But then you look around and you see some folks who it looks like that doesn't happen to them because they're, I've climbed into the clown suit of I'm the greatest of the great, the grandest of the grand, and nobody greater than me. Have you ever been around people like that? Yes. Do, yes. Do you want them as your friends? No. No. Do you want to spend time with them? Not at all. <laughs> and yet, you know, that clown suit feels to the person who's doing it this kind of artificial narcissism as though, you know, this is really special. I, you will want me because I'm special. No, you, that's not true, dude. You're, you're not going to be wanted because you're in a clown suit. Nobody wants to hang out with people in clown suits. How about the person behind those eyes? How about the person who's a richer, more interesting uh, kind of a mixture of positive and negative and not this uh, artificial on the greatest of the great things? So I think we're feeding narcissism, and we've seen it in the programs you talked about. For the first time on the planet, you produce people who are a combination of incompetent, <laughs> aggressive, and have high self-esteem. That didn't exist on the planet until psychologists got involved and artificially started ballooning this thing up. Blame it on a psychologist. Hey, at least they're working <laughs> I'm, to I'm fix one. it. I can do it. Hey, listen, <laughs> hey, we, we've caused the problem. We're here to fix it. <laughs> to, to go along with that, you know, you mentioned it, and here it is now coming home to roost. And we're seeing, let's go to the, the obvious culprit, like media. So we, we, we're seeing these reality television shows where there are these people, you just got to do it. You got, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're hearing this, and then we're so surprised when these people, who we who sell this idea of self esteem and confidence and all this, are we find out or need to go to rehab because right. their lives have spun completely out of control, and we're like, well, they had everything going on for them. They were so confident. They they were so self assured in all these moments. And, we're, and then we're like, how is this person so fragile that they're a heroin addict? Yeah. We're like, wow. Let me grab that word, Johnny, that confident word, because I like slowing these things down and, and looking at them, because actually our culture, our history, our language is wiser than the way we apply it. That word confident, con means with in Latin. Fident is from the Latin fides. It's the same as faith, same root, and the same as fidelity. In other words, how would you act with fidelity to yourself? When you put on a clown suit, that's the exact opposite. When you try to erase what's true in order for something else to be formally there, but not really there, not really a, what you want it to be about, uh, that's the exact opposite. It's absent of faith, it's absent of felt fidelity. So could we empower people to step into keeping the faith of themselves as whole human beings, to, to have that kind of self-fidelity. This is me, and this is my history. And given my history, if, for example, I've been abused and I'm now in an intimate uh, relationship, I'm going to feel insecure. There isn't any other way that's going to come, because we're historical beings, and you've got a half a billion year old processes that allow emotions that occurred earlier, every dog and cat and human being on the planet has. It's been around half a billion years. We know that. Brings it into the present. We want that because I want to remember this might be a dangerous situation. Oh yeah, this happened. This, I want that. 
but it, it's painful, it's difficult. Could we keep the faith for ourselves? Could we have that kind of self-fidelity that we get to have a history that isn't always sugar soup, that isn't always sweet? Uh, the, option, the alternative to that is this delusional kind of uh, clown suit that we're presenting to, I think, our children and to young people as an image of health, and it's anything but. Yeah, we had a, a guest on recently, Alex Benayan, who wrote a, a book, The Third Door, where he essentially sat down with really successful people, and time and time again, to his dismay almost, he found out that they also suffer with lack of confidence, doubt, this negative voice. And I feel like society rewards the solution. So everyone chases the solution and they've seen this is a problem. This negative self-talk is a problem. So give me a solution to this. And when you look at Eastern philosophy, the solution is living with it, understanding it, not removing it. Right. And it's in the process of trying to remove it that we've done all of this damage to young people and not allowed that self-doubt to actually propel you in the right direction, right? It can often propel you in the wrong direction, and now we're even seeing the clown suit, so to speak, on social media. Yeah. Everyone picturing themselves in the clown suit, the most confident version of myself, well, that's what gets posted. That video is what gets posted. It's not the follies, it's not the mistakes, it's not the out of focus or the real you, it's the artificial you. And to go along with that, I think that when this wave started with the selfless team and we started pushing, I think at some point the psychologists realized, okay, I, we're, we've screwed up. However, the, the regular public is not caught up to the advanced science and they doubled down. Yeah. Why is my kid having problems? We need, to, we need to cover them in more bubble wrap. We need to protect them even more from these terrible thoughts. And it, and it, and it is, as you call it, it has gotten, it's catastrophic. And the only thing I could think of when I was reading the article is that I, that, that I don't think Ameri the, the, the public is aware of just how catastrophic it is. Yeah. They're, they're living it out in their lives, but they're being told it's not true. And, and, you know, you have that immediate pop thing drawing you in, so you seem that kind of works for you. But we have contradictory things in the culture, too. We have wisdom traditions uh, showing up. We have on the media, for example, there's a really sweet piece of people doing act exercises that involve digging down to a self-critical thought and putting it to a single word and only doing this when they're really fed up you're done i'm not i'm not buying into this anymore writing it out in big bold letters and sticking it on your chest and so it's this piece of social media where you get to see people's insights and it's profoundly moving i mean i, I defy you to look at it without tearing up and what you see is that the person next to you is someone so confident etc you know, has this I'm unlovable thing inside, or, you know, I'm a liar, or, you know, uh, uh, nobody wants to be with me, I'm alone. In the, and could what would happen if we allowed our insides to come out? Could we create a community in which people could be whole human beings? I think that's possible. We could create a safe place where that's possible. So it doesn't always have to be the, here's the picture of the beach and the, 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 and the, the date and the car. And the, no, it could also be, here's the picture of what it's sometimes like to be inside my head. Yeah, I mean, these things go viral. I was just reading about a Victoria's Secret model who, who had a, a breakdown and was like, I can't mm -hmm. do social media anymore because internally is completely in conflict with what I am forced to post so that people view me, like me, they book jobs, and they think highly of me. And you see it time and time again with the youth in, in their use of social media. And we're gonna get into, after this commercial break, what we mean by self-compassion. I just wanna point out that what's interesting about that is in almost to get people to be more self-compassionate, they have to follow someone else's lead, right? So we need people at the top, the successful ones that we look and hold in high regard and say they have it all together, they're perfect to bear those imperfections to allow us to become more compassionate of ourselves. So apparently 
Self-esteem is not what many of us believe it is. Sure, low self-esteem is very detrimental to the quality of our life, but trying artificially to raise your self-esteem has a number of negative impacts on life. So apparently trying to boost our self-esteem by changing our thoughts or even actively fighting it is not the way to go. So if it's not changing our thoughts, then what is it that you believe is going to help us? You can change your relationship to your thoughts. You, it, it, very much like if I put an object on the table here in front of you and say, okay, I don't like that object. If you moved around to the other side of the table and look back, you have a different relationship to it and it might work in a different way. So what would happen if you took the parts of your history that you don't like when that evaluative part of you, that problem solving part of you gets involved? I don't like that feeling. I don't like that memory. I don't like that urge. I don't like that sensation. Okay, cool. I get that. What would happen if instead we then took that move of confidence, fidelity, faith, whole person, to stand with yourself kindly as you feel, think, remember that, and to connect with the fact that you're doing what everyone else around you is dealing with. They're just not talking about it. You're part of a common humanity here. And then to kind of open up your attention. So instead of kind of keeping the lid on and trying to hide, we take the lid off and gradually, don't do it all at once, begin to feel those more subtle things. Some of which are positive, some of which are negative. You know, one of the things we've found in this is that when you begin to do that, it isn't, the fear would be, oh, I'm going to like let all the monsters out from the basement. The next thing you know, <laughs> I've got like some sort of you know horror show of all these th well, A, you're not feeling or thinking anything you don't already feel and think already. Nothing's going to really surprise you. What? Like you, you, didn't, you weren't alive when that happened? You didn't yeah. know that was there? Yeah, you kind of hid it. Yeah. But B, there's other things that are hidden. Like, for example, positive feelings. Take the, the issue of uh, social anxiety, because I know you, your podcast has a history of really mm -hmm. focusing on that. If you're doing the the push out version of self esteem, if you're you know I only get the positive things, as you do that, you get less and less capacity to actually feel genuine happiness, joy, and connection, and you can see why. This has been done experimentally where people are socially anxious and they're trying to you know make sure it's only the positive things well somebody compliments them they invite them to come to a party it's a genuine kind of connection or something initially it's like woo that's but then it's scary what if i go there and i show you know i'm not able to yeah, but if i you know and all those fears show up but if i'm not able to you know interact with people in a way that they want to continue to be with me what if that feeling goes away and so you get this kind of roller coaster thing. So self-compassion is this stance of with kindness and openness and connection to common humanity. Can I feel, think, and remember what I feel, think, and remember? And as you begin to be able to do that with the so-called negative things, turns out, who knew? You're better able to do it with the positive things too because you hurt where you care. and. Yeah, you know, the reason why that betrayal really hurt is because love was important to you. The reason why that failure really hurt is you were trying to do something that made a difference and be successful in it. So the, the, that both sides, the both and quality of self-compassion gives you a way forward with the whole of you instead of trying to turn yourself into a cartoon that only has one kind of thing and at the cost of you don't get any of it. What you get is a clown suit. You know... If we go back to the pep rally and replace the self-esteem pep rally with the self-compassion pep rally. You betcha. Like now, we have children learning about empathy. We yeah. have children uh, learning that those bad feelings, everyone has them, and we're going to work on uh, replacing them with, with getting some victories and, and, and some, some better stuff. And now... I, I could see that there's more accepting of the children who are having a hard time and understanding their situation. And, and, and that's at, at that level. 
what does that move forward in then say 15 years for those children we we saw the other way that right. didn't go so well if we're <laughs> celebrating people who have high self-esteem in a way we're artificially enhancing the self-esteem to create the narcissist we're celebrating right. narcissists exactly. yes. which is not a path that that we need to be elevating I, we've taken that to the, to the hilt. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I look back on a lot of my formative years, and I I was protected in a way, and and things came naturally to me in school, and then it wasn't until I really got to graduate school that things didn't go so well, and I didn't have the tools. That's when the self esteem ran out, and when it ran out, then I had all these other negative feelings that I'd never felt before, and the wave of emotion that hit me through imposter syndrome was. I don't even want to go out. I don't even want to hang out with my friends. The world is ending. Right. And that level of depression is tough for people to fight out of. It is. And, you know, we now have done the studies where we've followed thousands of people over four, five, ten years. We know what happens if you are more open, accepting, mindful, self compassionate, is that you put yourself on a positive life trajectory. Not because it's all flowers and you know sweet smelling things and you know the music plays. No, it's because you have the flexibility to take a punch, to learn from it, to orient your attention towards what really matters in your life, and to get your feet linked to that. And you start building a life worth living one step at a time. You never finished. You don't get an award. You know, there's not a certificate at the end. This is a journey that. It's a positive journey, and I think you can define that positivity this way. Are you, over some reasonable period of time, because your mind will trick you with the immediate pop over just a matter of hours and minutes and so forth when you do these artificial things, over weeks and months, are you getting a greater sense of a space within which you can live your life, focus what's important, and actually move towards that with the whole of your history? No subtraction, no deletion with the memories you've got, the feelings you've got, the thoughts that you've got, and the ones that will be created. As you create a new journey, you may have relationships that work in a way that relationships never did before, and that may be a kind of sense of intimacy and love that you haven't experienced before. I'm not saying you know, you should just uh, accept what you've got, period, and story. No, it, it's a matter of the, the, the message that's inside the word acceptance, which was a meant to receive is just to receive a gift and we still have it in English and they say here will you accept this life is asking you here will you accept this and that this is your past if you can say yes to that well then you can accept what's ahead of you in the future too and that means you can afford the risk to care to love to connect to create to do new things to take new trajectories in life and so this isn't just kind of a, a dream there's too many studies now, too much data. I think we, we can bring something to the table as psychologists, speaking from my profession, a lot wiser than the, uh, the self-esteem movement. Yeah, that, there's uh, just three years ago a study done by Sarah Marshall that followed almost 2,500 ninth graders for a year. And we all know to the self-esteem pep rally, ninth yeah. grade is not an easy year for us. Oh, absolutely <laughs> not. Starting high school, mm. we're getting introduced to probably new people that we haven't met before who might not think highly of us. So our self-esteem is going to be taking a hit here. Well, and the study found that low self-esteem had very little effect on teenagers that had high levels of self-compassion. Right. So when we are practicing that acceptance and have self-compassion, that trumps self-esteem across the board. Yeah, because when you notice a, a, a difficult thought, for example, here's something I sometimes tell people. What if I could eliminate that negative thought completely, so profoundly, that when you have a friend, you have a family member, you have a kid later, later on, whatever, who comes to you and talks about that thing, some, something similar, you'll have no idea what they're talking about. You're gonna, you're gonna take that deal? And I'm not many, anybody who wants to take that deal. They want to have the wisdom from having dealt with negativity in a healthy way, and carrying it forward towards a life worth living, without the emotional and intellectual and psychological flexibility that it takes to do that. Well, it doesn't come in that package. But the positive message is these things are not that hard to learn. When you learn them, that can apply to many, many different situations. And you know, you can 
do something that allows you to understand when other people are in pain, when you see others suffering, that you can connect with them. But you also can put your own life on a trajectory that allows you to live the kind of life you want to live without any necessary, without first having to have that magic delete button or eraser that's going to take away your history, that almost self-attack as if I only get to me, be me when I start out being somebody else. Good luck with that. And there's, and you were mentioning, like, I heard that study was ninth grade, right? And for the, for the boys at that age, they're a little bit slower in developing. They're not going to, puberty is not going to start wreaking havoc on them for a couple more years. But the, the girls at that time are dealing with so many developing issues that, that are really impossible to, to comprehend everything that is going on at that, at that age. And and to tell <laughs> to set up the with the self esteem issue uh, of, of now that you're completely confused to everything that is going on in your in your mind in your body and all around you and you cannot question any of these things because everything's all right and you're a champion and you're good and you're golden right unless you have inflated <laughs> self worth however you're getting it unless you have inflated self worth you're not as valuable as the other people in the room. And that rat race can lead to damage, as we talked about. And in your article, you mentioned Dr. Kristen Neff, who's a leading researcher in the field as well. And she says self-compassion has three <clears throat> concepts, three components. Being kind to yourself, number one. Realize that everyone is dealing with these struggles, number two. And number three, be present in the moment with what you feel. Don't exaggerate the experiences and don't play them down. Sounds very easy in practice, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just those things, just check those three boxes, I'm golden. Obviously, it can be difficult to implement. So acceptance is the A in act, it is the right. first act, and now we have to actually commit to something to get the change to really happen. So it sounds to me like, as we mentioned earlier, Eastern philosophy has been big on this concept for mm -hmm. thousands of years now. Science is catching up. And being on the forefront of working with clients and, and um, in patients who essentially have these anxieties, have these really negative thoughts, what's one of the first things that we're going to ask them to do to really start this self-compassion route? If some of our listeners right now are understanding, hey, my self-esteem has been inflated, AJ, that imposter syndrome story is what I'm feeling right now, how do we start the change? Well, I think first we have to kind of create a space for it. And part of that is just enough is enough. I mean, if you're getting away with it, if, if you think everything's just moving along just fine, playing it the way you're playing it, well, you're not going to be very open to doing something different. Right. So let's just sort of sit down and what does your actual experience say? Not what does your mind say, because your mind's going to say a little more of the, the same thing you're doing will give you different outcomes than has ever given before. That's likely not true, but your experience is saying, no, I've played this thing out. So start with your own experience, and if it's not paying off to move in that direction, let's do something really different, not just moving the deck chairs around in the, the Titanic. Then the next thing is you've got to bring some awareness to it. You're going to have to start learning to catch that voice within that tells you, you know, you're a problem to be solved. <laughs> and not a, life is not a process to be experienced. It's a problem to be solved, and there's something wrong with you. If we can catch that voice, then if we can take a little step back and realize there's other things you can do with it. So one of the things that the ACT folks bring to the table in the area of self-compassion is teaching people what we, we call diffusion skills, or essentially mm -hmm. being able to look at your thoughts as thoughts. Metaphorically, it's like the difference between your hand being right in front of your eyes with a statement written on it, where that's all you can see is this negative statement, versus moving it out in a way enough that you can still see the statement over there, but you can look at the people around you, you can have a conversation, you can do things. We, uh, I have actually a TEDx talk, if people search for it, they'll find it, uh, one done at the David's Academy, which is where people who are at the 99.9th percentile yes. can go to school uh, uh, there in uh, Reno. Uh, the University of Nevada uh, campus. And I walk through about 12 different methods, one after another. And I start off with things that are very simple. I'll, I'll give, you, give you one. If you've got a really negative thought that's sort of sticky, uh, try singing the thought. I suggest uh, happy birthday. 
if not pick your fam- favorite tune whatever like songify you know some of these <laughs> apps that are out there not be careful not to ridicule but just to notice this is just a voice uh, and i actually suggest people give their mind a name and literally okay so mine is called george what does george have to say and noticing these thoughts because if somebody outside of you said a thought like that you'd have enough distance that whether or not you did what they said would be up to you some thoughts are really helpful you got to do your taxes this is how to fix the car you know you haven't uh, done your laundry other things not so much deep down there's something wrong with you you're a really bad person maybe a different way of dealing with these different uh, thoughts but Uh, In these methods and in the TED Talk, I come back to one that I want to mention now because it um, kind of cements in this is not self-ridicule. You're not a ridiculous person. As I ask people to picture how old were they when they first ever had a thought like that. And most people, when I'm working with a client, actually do it by height. And I'll say, how tall were you? And they start saying about there at like four, five, six, I mean, little ones. We were worried about whether or not we're welcome, lovable, able, we're gonna be successful when we were quite young. And now they're projecting into our adult lives. And I asked the person to picture what you looked like from your school pictures, the goofy hair, the silly clothes, etc., And then even remember what you sounded like And take that thought that you're ridiculing yourself with and have it come out of the voice of that child at that age. And what it will pull from you is something you can do with yourself when you're looking at the person in the mirror. You don't have to be seven or eight to be kind to yourself. You don't have to be a kid for it to be okay, for that life is hard and sometimes we don't know what to do. Or that you've sometimes had experiences that will be painful and will be remembered and echoed the rest of your life. But can we at least treat ourselves with the kindness that we would bring to a child? Just because we grew up, that means we're not deserving of it, really. So that you could look at that person in the mirror with those negative thoughts, but have that little element of kindness and being able to attend without judgment to what it's like to be you. Yeah, if if your four-year-old version of yourself said, I feel unloved. Yeah you wouldn't make fun of them you wouldn't ridicule them you wouldn't say what the heck is wrong with you you would be very supportive and empathetic in your response to them we have within us this wisdom it isn't just the eastern traditions or the wisdom traditions of other kinds we have it by our own experience and it's easy to show i mean if you if you had a spectacular sunset uh, tonight you're going to look at it and you're probably going to go wow you're probably not going to go man that's too much pink more blue over there would be good that Look at how that cloud is shaped. Oh, God. It could be a lot better if it was. You're not going to do that. If you had a crying child in front of you talking about some horrific experience and cry right in front of you, I bet you the very first word out of your mouth is the same one. Wow. You're probably not going to say, could you talk about something a little nicer? <laughs> You're bumming me out here. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. Well, That means we know how, both with sweet and sad things, to appreciate, to observe, to describe, to notice, and not have to immediately get in there and race and change. And, you know, that'll happen over time, fine. We can do something about the crying child, et cetera. But so I, I, one way I like thinking about this is not just treating your life as a math problem, but treating it more in the wow of just appreciating life as it is and how it's unfolded for you, sweet and sad. And that little space of compassion allows you to do new things, things that you've never done before. Like, I'll give you an example. You could write out that word and stick it on your chest. I mean, you, you, can, you can do things that break the rules. You can share with others what it's like to be you. Pick people who are safe and not saying walk around. And don't do this until you've done your homework. Don't expect just putting it out there is going to eliminate it. It's not another version of a eraser. I'm just saying there's very, very new things that are possible, like carrying your anxiety with you the way you carry your wallet and doing bold and interesting things that really push out the limits where you don't know if you can do it. Let's find out. That's cool. Uh, One of the things that 
<clears throat> that we focus on on the show and that we're trying to bring to light is that with these tools, with these tactics, you know, self-development doesn't have to be a, a, a terrible thing. It could actually be quite a fun thing. And if you're focused on the wrong things, such as these nasty, these bad thoughts, and to do self-development, only have to would you would have to admit that you were you have problems and you're broken and all these other things. And if we go to to the self-compassion realm, is that we can you can enjoy this process, and even after 35, 40 years of running in a certain direction of that self-esteem train to now use act incorporate it into your life and all of a sudden your days become much lighter your days become fun i can now start to correct some of the damage that is done and of course with that compassion you're going to be looking to help others around you and all of a sudden what previously had seemed like why should I wake up today it's just going to be another shit day like yesterday all of a sudden it becomes tomorrow is going to be even better than today was and that cycle now perpetuates itself in that direction which is why I love self-development so much because the moment that I discovered it my days have completely changed and not only was it a challenge to make it better it just it just happened by f default of using these techniques. Yeah, they flow out naturally because I think what you're doing is you begin to focus on what you care about, what you yes. value, what you want to build, what you want to create, what you want to add. There's no mm -hmm. deletion, there's no subtraction. Nope. You don't have to stop and wait. Life can start now and move in the positive direction, not in a way to fight a war or eliminate something, but because that's what you came here to do. I got stuff to do, really cool stuff. Yes. Like to create, to learn, to connect, to, to have fun. To, and so, you know, I think that values journey is the one that really makes sense of self compassion. We're not talking about wallowing, we're ta not talking about, oh, just. You know, tears per minute is the measure of psychological health or something. We're talking about being open in such a way that we can then shift our attention towards what brings meaning and purpose to our life and, and chasing that. You know, a metaphor for it might be like if you life has given you salt, salty water. There's this stuff in there, man, this just doesn't taste right. Like, wow, I've got that painful memory. I've got that judgment. I've got that... You know, my mother was so self-critical, and my dad was an alcoholic, and I saw this, whatever the thing was, right? And you have this idea, if I can just get rid of the salt, this thing will be a lot better tasting. Well, you try to grab those salt grains with tweezers <laughs> and take them out one at a time, and then you're going to live? Uh, you're never going to get to the next stage. You're never going to start. What if you just start putting water in there, clean water? What if the next day was about building your business or making mm -hmm. a connection with somebody Absolutely. you love or creating a space in which you can be more intimate and open with somebody? If you're adding fresh water to it pretty soon. Turns out that salty thing, I mean, you ever tasted sold water versus water with a little bit of salt in it? I think it's pretty clear which one you like. Sugar soup is maybe what your mind thinks you need, <laughs> but it isn't really what a human life needs to have. I mean, you've got kind of like a variety of flavors here and it humanizes you that you know something about pain you can connect with others because of it, it yes it, it makes you more able to connect with others that you know something about self-judgment because they have it too and so if we could come together in community as real conscious whole human beings empower people to move towards what they really care about carrying with them the whole of their history that's kind of an awesome thing and it can start now you don't have to wait uh, if you have to wait for the delete button you're going to wait a long time if you're going to wait for your life how about this next moment how about this next day this next hour what's there for you to do well i don't know what do you want to do and can we put that into people's lives and empower them and people come to you when you do it i'm sure you've seen it john so as oh, yeah. you get that space people who see that they want to be part of that of, like wow of I, course i want that of course and it goes to the show you had given an example of do we want to hang out with the, the brag, braggy narcissist like of, of course not we want to be able to hang out with somebody 
who can understand our pain and who's been through it and could give a helping hand when we're in it. And you know, when we look at things through the lens of doing all this work, it, it, it can seem on all this work on ourselves, it could seem daunting and frustrating. Like I've not to go through another shit day where I have to go through all these thoughts, but it, it, it gets, it, it gets better. It gets lighter. It gets brighter. Uh, more um, better people come into your life um, and and I think this answers that question of when people see so let's and I, I don't know Anthony Bourdain's reasons for yeah. him doing what he did but when people look at people like Anthony and they see somebody who who went through a battle yeah. who does all the things that uh, healthy people should be doing going to the gym working out getting involved in BJJ, um, uh, get, getting healthy, and, ha and, have, and then focus on a career and it blossom. How could he still do that thing? Well, if, if you're in that train of thought where every day is going to be a fight and a battle for you to feel good, and eventually it gets so bad that there, there isn't. Yeah. Um, and if we can shift the agenda here, so instead of trying to feel good, we do a good job of feeling, that's something you can start now. Even mm -hmm. if what you have there to feel is difficult, it's not going to stay that way. Emotions come and go. You get emotions that get sticky, that hang around, or self-judgments that get sticky and hang around. The single biggest way to do it is you try to grab them and throw them away. It's like grabbing flypaper and then you try to throw <laughs> it or grabbing tar paper. You know, it's just going to, instead, could we notice them, bring our kind of sense of self-compassion and kindness to it. Get a little bit of perspective. Notice that there's a human being, notice them, them. You're not just what your mind says you are. You're a much more complicated and more beautiful and able person than that. And then move your attention towards what you care about. Now start getting your feet moving in that direction. Not to run away from this other thing, but to move towards what you care about. It's not distracting, it's attracting. And when you're doing that, then you start attracting people to you, energy to you, success to you, opportunities to you. Life unfolds, not in a simple, easy way. I'm not you know, doing a version of the secret or something here. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, people who are growing and expanding, experiencing, you know, that draws thing, energies to you because people want to be partners with you on that journey. They want to support you in a journey like that. Yeah, and we just naturally surround ourselves with like-minded people. Yeah. yeah. We, we form groups and tribes. We look for people to identify based on behaviors and their thoughts and their words. And a lot of us don't even realize that we're either collecting positive people or negative people in our lives. Yeah. And that's one of the first lessons that we talk about yeah. on boot camp is a lot of us have gone through life maybe not having the tools to make new friends, so we haven't been as selective with the people that we invite into our lives. And sometimes, you know, circumstances come into play, but now we've collected this, you know, wolf pack of people who they have their views and we're adopting their views. But through osmosis, we have problems, we share them, and then we get their solutions. And all of a sudden, if we're surrounding ourselves with people who can't diffuse from their thoughts and emotions, and project those onto us, well then we're gonna have some really negative consequences and impacts on our personal well-being. And I think what's so great about the C in all of this is the commitment to it, yeah. the moving through it, right? It's, and whether it's committing to a half marathon, committing to get better socially, committing to that career promotion, when we commit to things as humans, we give ourselves more power to actually move forward. Right, and it's not wallowing in it. It's right. not giving up. Oh, I have these negative thoughts, so this is just life, and tomorrow's going to be harder than the next. It's saying there are other things in my life that are really important to me that I'm going to work towards, and I'm not going to let the bully. I'm not going to let George right. keep me from those things. You, the thing that happens, and the way that you were just talking, that you, with things coming towards you from the people that you've drawn around you, that's also true of you towards them. And we know if you change your behavior in some way, the research on this has been done, your friends will move, the friends of those friends will move, and the friends of those friends will move. There could be a person sitting here listening to this podcast that literally has like 15,000 people sitting next to him. The choices that that person make is gonna flow out 
through the culture in ways. And we've done research on this. Like if you have a, a business or a clinic or a family, if you're a parent, you know, when you're doing the, you know, out with the bad thoughts, in with the good kind of versions of self-esteem and avoiding difficult emotions, when people around you now face challenges, they are much more likely to traumatize themselves, much more likely to have anxiety, depression, substance abuse, less likely to be able to orient towards their values and build their life out. So we all have a stake in our ch each other's development. We're on a journey together. I like that. We're not alone. Wonderful. We're not cut off. We're connected. And so could we, not in some narcissistic way, but in a responsible way, what that word means, the ability to respond in a responsible way, take advantage of our own capacity to create a life with a direction and put things into the communities around us, the people we love and care about, that are sustaining and supporting of them. How do we know that? It's sustaining and supporting of us. And so this, we're in this weird conspiracy where, you know, you support me and what doesn't work for me and I'll support you and doesn't what work, what doesn't work for you. You know, where we, where we compare our other people's outsides to our insides, but we never tell the truth. We never actually say, you know, that doesn't, that isn't how it is for me. If we flip it the other way, the same social processes that are leading to the problems you don't have to open your eyes to see, now can build out this kind of development in a way that will have an impact on the world, really. I mean, it really will. One person, one moment, one life, one opportunity, one step forward at a time. And that's a kind of cool. We get to be part of something a lot bigger than, which is, you, you want a reasonable way to say it? Putting love into the world instead of fear. What if we just did that, if our lives are about that? Uh, it would move the world and uh, I th think you open your eyes and look, we need it. Yeah, absolutely. We don't have to get into too much of a worldview to, to know that. Most of our yeah. listeners know exactly what we're talking about here. I think the one thing that I, I know listeners are thinking and they, they're in their minds are going, okay, self-compassion, that's great. But if I become too self-compassionate and I just accept, okay, this is what it is, then yeah, I can have all the junk food. I can make really poor decisions. I can drink all the sugar soup, right? <laughs> so is there too much self-compassion and is there a governor in your mind that we need to keep on our compassion so we don't just wallow away? Well, the reason why ACT has that C in there, it's acceptance and commitment. If it were just acceptance period, end of story, if it really was just about, if you just were open and, well, in the service of what? Why? Why would I do that? Well, because you have a life to live. Well, what kind of life do you want to live? And, you know, superficially it may look like, gee, you know, if I just was eating ice cream from morning to night and you know, not going to the gym, etc., that would be really cool. No, it, that's not true. If you went to the gym yesterday, you're probably still feeling it today. Of course. You feel better. And Anybody can do it and sense it very quickly. Haven't you been through that? You go like, oh my God, I've been exercised for this period of time. I do it and immediately my body says, yes. Well, that tells me that somehow we're getting in the way of stuff that we know works better. And there's certain kinds of things. I mean, belonging and connection. Loneliness is not good for people. That's not the kind of monkey we are. We're the kind that wants to be with others. Can we figure out how we can be with others in a way that's not some sort of uh, parody or clown suit, but is real, that opens you up, doesn't empty you out? Same thing with feeling. We want to feel, but if you, if you just try to feel good, eventually you can't feel at all. So instead, could we do a good job of feeling and support ourselves in doing that? And, and competence, learning how to get out there and actually do things that make a difference and being able to have meaning and purpose by choice. So if you don't put values into the conversation, and all the wisdom traditions that work on this openness, mindfulness, they all have a values part. Now, in a religious context, they get to do that. The monk yeah, can say, absolutely. here's right action. Yeah. Well, if we're not doing it that way, you better look at that person in the mirror and do much the same thing. What am I up to? What do I really care about? What 
you know, what are the qualities of being and doing? I don't mean the things I'm grasping at and holding on to. I don't mean the car and the money. And I mean, what are the qualities of your life that you want to be manifest in the world by what you actually do with your feet, with your behavior, with your moments? And you'll have them. You have them in your heroes. You have them in your sweet moments. You have them in your pain. Take the pain and flip it over and you'll see you cared about something. And you have them just in the story that you're writing about your life. If you could just sit down and write the next chapter and you don't get to choose the exact elements and the characters, but you get to choose the theme. What's the theme that you want in this next chapter? It's up to you. So I think we have that capacity for authorship, for genuineness, for openness that's connected in this rich way to our own life. And sue me if you don't like it, but this is what I care about, and this is what I'm up to, and this is what I'm putting into the world. And my guess is you put it through that, it's not going to be sugar soup. I've not actually met anybody who puts them through themselves through that kind of gut check, person in the mirror, what do you really care about, dude? What are you going to put into your behavior? And I don't see people going through that and say, you know, I just want to lie better. I want to. I want to. I want to <laughs> pretend more. I want to pretend so well that no one's ever knows that I'm pretending. And I don't see that. What I see is people wanting love and connection, contribution, community. They they want to see a healthy mind and body. They want to be living. Yeah, that gives energy, not yes. takes yeah. energy. Right? Mm-hmm. The clown suit takes energy. It's exhausting. Yes. Anyone in the clown suit, you can see the pain in their eyes. They are exhausted. They are tired of it. It sucks that they have to get attention because of it, but that's the card that they know how to play. And yeah. it's, it's worked so far, so they're stuck with it. And, and in that moment, John, you talk about when you wake up in the morning and there's a, that kind of wow. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, here's what I get to do this. And it may be a challenge. It may be like, wow, I'm not sure I'm 100% able to do this. Thing. Absolutely. Do. And wow, I get to, yeah. I mean, so if love doesn't land as a, a way of talking about it, vitality would be pretty darn close. And if even that doesn't work, just being would be pretty close. That space of being present and in this loving way, moving towards what brings vitality and purpose in your life is what the whole point of self-compassion, acceptance, diffusion, mindfulness, attentional flexibility, that, that's the whole point of it, is so that the next foot can hit the ground of Start moving towards what you care about. Well, it's, it's interesting because we, in, in the boot camp program we've been running for over a decade, we have a, a section around defining your values. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the number of guys when we get to that section who can't put pen to paper and are just kind of stumped, right? And when we started to ask that in our challenge group, we have a, a Facebook group where you can sign up for free, theartofcharm.com slash challenge. And I believe it's uh, exercise or challenge number two is defining your yes. values. Yeah. And some people don't even get to challenge two. They, they quit there. As someone who now has defined my values, wow, that commitment to them, right? The compass in the right direction is that wake up in the morning with no yeah. alarm clock. Is that, okay, I know that what I'm doing is meaningful and can propel you through all of this other stuff that we talked about, right? The negative feelings, all this emotional stuff that we're dealing with, those thoughts that come up. And we have an entire class in Core Confidence. This idea of understanding your values and putting some actual time to define them can empower you to work through these things. It does not have to be this mental exercise that we put off till, well, I'll, I'll get there when I'm 40. I'll yeah. get there when, in my next job, when I'm retired. That's when I'll start thinking about philanthropy and values and all that stuff. Your whole life takes shape at, the, at that moment. And I always laugh because for the there's the people who can't put pen to paper because they're like, what? And then there's the people who are like, oh, that's easy. And then they get to three and they realize they only have two more choices for the values that are important to them. And all of a sudden they start to bug out and they'll even quit. We've seen it in our analytics of people stopping because they haven't finished that challenge. And it's and it, they get caught up in this idea that what I put is now stuck. Right. And, and of course it doesn't. It changes as your wants change, right? Like. I, and I always use this example of, I think everyone can can say that being a good father, if you have children, is a wonderful value to have. Well, I don't have children. So 
that, that value doesn't go on my five. Exactly. Of course, I, I think it's an, an incredible value to have high for someone who has children. So, and so as your needs change, those values can change. And then, and being able to wake up and, and engaging in those and knowing that, that this comfort of wasting your life or floundering, uh, feeling lost is now gone because you're engaged in the things that matter most to you. There's a way that might help of, of folks if uh, values are of importance, which is to hold them lightly and pursue them passionately. Oh. And you know, the, 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 what happens when you bog down is this judgmental thing comes in, like this is going to be the set list. Oh no, it starts immediately feeling oppressive. <laughs> well, it's not by accident. I mean, this word evaluation and the word values has the same root in there and you can turn it into another stick to hit yourself over the head and ears about, oh, I didn't live my values. Slow it down, dude. What are you doing right now? What is that about? What is the value that's reflected in what you just did there? And it's right back to the same old, same old of, uh, you know, I can start living when I, you know, get all of that um, thoughts, feelings, memories lined up in a row. Instead, think of it more like you would uh, picking a destination or picking a game. Have you ever seen kids play? Like, I can get to that tree over there before you touch me. And as much life energy as they have to give is in that moment. Yeah. And they're laughing and running and they're going for it, right? What if values are like that? Like, not because there's gonna be a prize or applause or not, no, because it's just in me, I can, I can do that. I can be about that, I can go in that direction. Watch me, and you know, putting your life energy into, metaphorically, like running towards that tree, it could be creating this podcast that will change hundreds of thousands of lives. You know, think about how important that could be on the planet. As you do the multiple. It isn't just those hundreds of thousands, it's millions of people. Yeah. So I'm not saying that I haven't had the conversation with you. I don't exactly know all of what's inside what you're doing right here. But that opportunity is there with every single person listening to us right now. So hold it lightly, pursue it passionately. And, and thinking about it more kind of like you would like a game. You know, there's certain rules. Like if you want to play the game of being a good dad, there's certain rules. You want to play the game of being a good partner in a business, there's certain rules. And okay, within those rules, can I actually put that into my behavior? And uh, it's fun, it's uh, recreation. I mean, in other contexts, you pay money to be able to do it. You don't have to pay money to be able to do this. You can just do it. Yeah. As, this is what I'm up to. And Sue me if you don't like it. <laughs> we've found time and time again that when you get oriented on those values and you're running towards that tree, the people that want to join you in that journey can empower you. Yeah. When you don't have the values, you're unclear, you're wishy-washy, you're not sure, you'll take whatever you can get. Well, it's a very empty life. You have acquaintances, you don't have friends, you don't have that vulnerability, you don't have that ability to connection. and last month's theme around connection flows from that empathy yeah. and that vulnerability that's what we're talking about here and when you define those values you commit to those values and sure they're going to change and you don't have to beat yourself up if they shift but wow you're really cooking with gas now you're welcoming in the right people into your life you're taking steps to actually accomplish what matters to you and not feel lost at sea that space of shared values and vulnerability is creating intimacy and connection. You think about it, the people you feel close to, you know something about what they care about, you know something about their vulnerabilities. And so that theme we were talking about earlier, if people come to you, if you're on a values-based journey and you're doing it in a way that's open and flexible and kind of out there, not this clown suit way, the people who come to you will be people who want to be on that journey with you. And, and they're very often exactly the kind of people that you want to be with anyway. Yeah. And so that, you know, you get this kind of, this kind of gravitational force in which community begins to support you and your connections with others are part of a larger part, pattern of building that uh, life worth living. I love it. Thank you for joining us today. It's not often we have the actual author yes. of the article in studio to join us. Fantastic. I would love the audience as a takeaway to think about this one question. Where in your life do you want to be more compassionate towards yourself? 
Let us know by sending us an email or through social media at The Art of Charm or by leaving us a voice message. Questions at theartofcharm.com is a great place to submit those. And where can our audience find more about you, Stephen? Well, if they want to get a little seven-lesson mini-course on ACT, if they go to stephenchayes.com, um, I'll be happy to send it to them. Highly recommend it. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Awesome.